Regional Anesthesia for Breast and Abdominal Surgery. Surgery. Thank you for joining us. My name is Heidi Border and I'm Meetings Manager for ASRA and will be the host for tonight's webinar. We are joined tonight by our moderator, Mark Leonard, CAA at Team Health in Trinity, Florida, and Assistant Professor at Nova Southeastern University in Tampa, who is going to introduce tonight's topic and speakers. Welcome, Mark. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I say good evening. Uh, it's evening where I am uh, in Tampa, Florida, and it's evening where uh, Dr. Wallach is. Um, so wherever you are joining us from around the world, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, during our presentation today, if you have any questions uh, for the panelists, could you please type them into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, we'll chat to you through the chat panel, but all, key, all questions should be given to us through the Q&A window. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker tonight. Dr. Lopez Warwick, Alicia Lopez Warwick, sorry, is an MD in a private practice regional anesthesia practice in Raleigh, North Carolina. She has a passion for acute pain medicine and a large focus on improving systems to provide acute pain procedures for women. She's the author of the chapter Acute Pain Service in the newest book, Acute Pain Medicine, that was recently published by the American Academy of Pain Medicine. She has established many private practice ERAS teams, including a current project for PEX blocks for mastectomy and breast reconstruction surgery. She loves all things social media, as I've found recently, and she's a great member of the ASRA Special Interest Group for social media. She believes in the power of social media for physicians and teaches other physicians how to hone in and use this power, especially on Instagram. You can find it on all platforms at, at AliFitMD, which will be on your screen once she starts. And you can reach out to either of us via social media. Our social media links will be posted at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Warlick for today's presentation. Thanks so much, Mark. I am so glad to be here, everybody. I know you're spending time here out of your busy night, or maybe you're at work. I have some friends on here that are on call that are watching this in their call rooms. The fellows that are all being forced to watch this by their attendings. I hope you get something out of it. And thank you for ASRA for um, giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm also on the special interest group, uh, the social media committee on ASRA, and it's been amazing. Um, I recommend you check out all the special interest groups. It's really helped me um, make more friends and kind of see how the ASRA platform works. Um, and thank you for Payant for giving me the opportunity to spread the good word about acute pain medicine and how to help everybody that's listening, anesthesiologists, staff, to help women with acute pain. And I'll tell you the reasons why. I think we can get started. Shall we? Shall I get started, Mark? Yes, please. Okay, let me share my screen here. Okay, I'm going to get that laser. There we are. Okay, and I think everybody can see this. Okay, there is my, um, I think you can see my Twitter handle here. I am AliFitMD on all platforms, so you can even tweet at us. We can be interacting later on after the webinar through the social media worlds. I love it. Um, so tonight's talk is on focusing on your female patients. I um, regional anesthesia for breast and abdominal surgery. So I'm going to be focusing on um, the procedures that I use for breast surgeries. In particular, I'm going to be talking a lot about um, modified radical mastectomy or MRM as it's sometimes abbreviated in the literature. Um, and then for abdominal surgery, I'm going to focus on C-section. However, I'll mention a few things about hysterectomy as well, but you can extrapolate the nerve blocks and sort of the anatomy for hysterectomies as well. Um, all right. So my outline is going to be, um, I'll be, I'll be kind of sort of giving you a case for why we should be concerned with acute pain in female patient, female surgical patients. Um, if you don't already have a reason for um, offering regional anesthesia or you don't have a plan in place, I'm going to give you some food for thought. 
And then I'm going to take you through two separate sections of this talk by giving you um, instructions on how I do a PEX 1 and 2 block, what positions I place the patient in, some of the images I find very helpful and the images I want you to find as well, and how I do it exactly. Um, it, may be, it may not be how you do it or you've been taught to, but, but I want you to open your mind to new ideas and maybe new ways to do things. Uh, the second part of the talk, I'm going to talk about TAP and QL blocks for C-section and give you some secrets and tips on how I do those as well. And um, remember that this is all in the context of I work in a very high volume, very fast moving private practice world. So, and I have been in academics before and I know those two worlds are different, but I, I am willing to take questions about either of those worlds um, because I know they function on two different levels and sometimes those affect how you deliver regional anesthesia and where you deliver it. So I'll be commenting on that as well. Um, so let me just, paint you a picture of why we should maybe be concerned about acute pain, um, surgical pain in breast surgery first. So we all know that acute pain, especially in mastectomy um, in the recovery room is a problem, can be a problem, especially without regional anesthesia on board. These acute pain problems can turn into chronic pain syndromes. Um, the syndrome that is talked about in the literature is the post mastectomy pain syndrome. So we want to avoid that, right? Because we know that chronic pain syndromes place tax, a tax, a burden on not only the patient, of course, suffering, but their families, um, the system, the economic system. We know that chronic pain syndromes, we don't want to be dealing with those. And I want you to sort of consider that if there's any way we can prevent that path down the chronic pain road that we should. Um, there was a quote in one of the papers that I read that really stood out to me that said, acute post-operative pain is a consistent modifiable risk factor for post-mastectomy pain syndrome. That really stood out to me because um, I'll tell you something personal, my med school roommate has recurrent breast cancer. And I know that, you know, she's, she's talking to me about maybe things she could have done with her first surgery to prevent the recurrence. And I know that I, if it were her and I was treating her, I would want her to have regional anesthesia. So this was sort of surprising to me when I was looking at the literature that about 20 to 30% of the patients having breast surgery will experience chronic pain. This study down here by Spivey from 2018 talks about those risk factors. I think that's a pretty high percentage. And I was pretty surprised and I didn't really, I hadn't really thought about it in a while about that percentage and um, you know, why do these acute pain patients turn eventually into chronic patients or pain patients that do have persistent pain after mastectomy. Let me show you another study, this study by Habib in 2018, um, also looked at risk factors for turning that severe acute pain into persistent pain. Um, and these two studies together, I'm going to give you a little tip here. So when you're thinking about whether should I block this patient, should I offer regional anesthesia to this patient, or should I have a conversation with my surgeon? Sometimes it's an intimidating conversation or they are a surgeon that does not want regional, whatever the fact may be. I think that we all sort of, when we look at a patient scheduled for mastectomy with reconstruction, or axillary node dissection, we think, can I provide the, this acute pain block? Does the surgeon welcome this block? And these are the patients that I want you to, if, if you're having trouble kind of making the leap into like, yes, let's block this patient. I want you to look out for these specific patients for, because both of these studies um, pointed to that these patients have a much higher risk of chronic pain. So the patient that has is posted for an axillary node dissection, right? Or um, a patient that's young and obese and baseline anxiety or baseline catastrophizing. Okay, those patients are the ones that spe especially need um, acute pain management during mastectomy because those are the ones, according to the literature, these studies that later on have, they are the ones that those 20 to 30% have chronic pain or problems with pain after breast surgery. So the conclusions to this Habib paper stated that they listed a lot, a lot of risk factors, in, including increased duration of surgery. That is another 
that is another like red flag to you if the surgeon is going to take a, an extra long time in surgery that there may be a higher risk of the acute pain turning into chronic pain. But I underlined in red that one of the risk factors is the severity of acute pain, right? So if we can maybe look at that and think about the ways we can decrease the severity of acute pain in mastectomy, I think that may lead us to the answer. Um, let's now talk about acute pain in C-section. All right, so, so some, these are the things that I've heard from some of my you know, colleagues, even surgeons saying that patients after C-section don't need a block or maybe they're not in that much pain or they don't need it. I want you to have a response to that, um, that statement because let's remember that C-section is the most common surgical procedure in the United States. We do 1.3 million C-sections a year. And those of us that do OB anesthesia overnight, we, we know that this is true. <laughs> on some nights we feel like we're doing C-sections all night and on some nights it is true. Um, pain after C-section will increase postpartum depression. Pain after C-section decreases the ambulation times in these women. Pain that is not controlled will decrease the ambulation times, thus increasing the risk of DVT and PE, the things that we really want to prevent, right? We've all been doing post-op rounds on C-section patients the next day, and we've seen the patients that are in so much pain that they have not gotten up and walked around. That is one of my questions that I ask my patients have you gotten up and walked around? And some of them say no because of the pain. If you ask them where the pain is, they point to the incision, but they also point to their belly. So I want to just leave these two references here, these two um, studies um, talking about the risk of DVT and the risk of postpartum depression. So you can go back and reference these if you need to be convinced more that treating pain in C-section is very worthwhile. Let's go to this next one. Okay, so let's talk about, let's dive right in and talk about pectoralis nerve blocks. What are pectoralis nerve blocks? Pectoralis nerve blocks are fascial plane blocks that we use to anesthetize the anterior chest wall. We use higher volumes in fascial plane blocks as opposed to perineural blocks. I always get asked this question like, should I drop my volumes for fascial plane blocks? No, the higher volume is the reason that we can have this spread across the fascial planes. We sort of use the fascial planes as a network or a highway to spread our local anesthesia, right? As opposed to a perineural injection where we want to put, place the local very closely around those nerves, this is different. You can do the pectoralis nerve block awake or asleep. And this block is indicated for a lot of chest procedures, but these are the ones that I use, I use the pe pex blocks for. So I place pex blocks in, when I can in modified radical mastectomy cases, especially the ones that have axillary node dissection with them, because that's, remember we saw from that paper, that is an, even more of an increased risk of chronic pain. And then I use this a lot in the cath lab where we are being, um, we are anesthetizing patients for cardiac implants, like a pacemaker or an AICD on one side. So those cases are really great to, to use the pex blocks in. Now, let me just comment on the awake or asleep. What I get this question sometimes, and maybe I can help some people here understand my reasoning behind doing this awake or asleep. Remember that the, the fascial plane blocks, you, you can do these asleep, right? They're not perineural blocks, and it is okay to have a patient asleep while you're doing a fascial plane block. You, um, you choose either one, and so sometimes your system chooses for you, right? So in an academic center, you're probably doing these awake in the pre-op area under sedation, right? Some of these women, like I, I showed you in the beginning of this talk, that some of the women are very anxious. There's a lot of anxiety around breast surgery. And so sometimes I choose to do these in the operating room if I have a patient that is crying in the pre-op area that is so anxious and very, very nervous when I feel like they are not going to do well even awake while I do these blocks. So I'll just take them to the OR. I have the luxury of sometimes doing my blocks in the operating room. Um, after induction. So uh, I'll show you in some of the pictures that follow how I do the block when the patient is asleep. But if, it, if you were to ask me how I like to do my PEX blocks, I'd rather just do them asleep. Okay, I'd rather just do them asleep because of the anxiety level of a lot of these patients. 
what is the pectoralis nerve block? Well, it is depositing local between in two spots, actually. The first spot is the PEX1, the nomenclature is PEX1 block. And that's depositing my local anesthetic between the PEC major and the PEC minor muscles. Um, that anesthetizes the medial and the lateral pectoral nerves. Um, and anesthetizes the pec, the pec muscles themselves. So anything that cuts through the pec muscle or stretches that pec muscle is going to be blocked by a pex one. And I'll show you the images for that. The pex two block, which in the nomenclature and the literature, if you ever read an article about it or a study about it, this pex two block includes the pex one block. So it, it includes that first block of the pectoralis muscles as well as placing local anesthesia between the pec minor and the serratus anterior, anesthetizing the intercostals of that chest wall, the innervation to the skin, and intercostal brachial nerve as well. There is probably going to be questions about the serratus nerve block. That is just a more distal and caudal nerve block of the serratus anterior muscles. I won't be really discussing that because we discussed that um, a few weeks ago in the other talk, but I can still take questions on that. But I'm going to be talking about the PEX1 and the PEX2 block. Let me just throw this out there that these blocks are really good at treating that sort of stretchy pain that women report after mastectomy with reconstruction. Because with the not just not just the patients that have mastectomy, okay, they do have incisions and these blocks treat that. But when they place the um, the implants and there is the pain with, associated with that, the stretching and pulling pain with the implant and the expander. They might place an expander or they might place an implant right after mastectomy, same surgery. That pain is very well treated with this, with these PEX blocks. Okay, this is exactly how I do my PEX blocks. Um, First, th this patient is asleep. I'm doing this patient, this, I'm doing this block asleep in the operating room. And you can see, here's my laser, that this patient is, the head is turned this way away from my sight. I have the arm abducted about 45 degrees. Some people move this arm out all the way to 90, but I find that it's easy just to leave it here at 45 degrees. It doesn't bother me much. I have a parasagittal view. Okay, so this is, this is the medial line. I have a I have a paramedian, sorry, paramedian sagittal view. Okay, this view is a sagittal view, meaning that it kind of cuts through the body from the front to the back. So I am looking at this image in the infraclavicular position. So this is the same position that I would use to view the cords, the, the cords of the brachial plexus in this position. And um, I'll show you the image that you're gonna get is this image. This is the, the view of the infraclavicular position. So I'm looking for three things here in this picture. I'm looking for um, the artery, okay? I'm gonna find this axillary artery with the axillary veins next to it. And I'm gonna find what I colored in yellow and blue, which is this pec major muscle and this pec minor muscle. So that's my first image. And I'm gonna show you three positions. This is the first one and the image. So you can screenshot this or go back and play this and have this in your mind. First image you're gonna record. You can actually see the cord coming off here. This is the posterior cord and this is the lateral cord. Um, and so these two cords, the medial and the lateral cords um, give rise to the lateral and the medial pectoral nerves that su eventually supply those pectoralis muscles. So let's go to the second position. How am I gonna to get to the second position? Well, I simply take my probe right up that I have right up, up against the clavicle and I just tilt it. I'm just doing a tilty maneuver this way and I'm dropping the probe. I use a linear probe into the chest to sort of peek into the chest. It's not a sliding and it's no movement of the probe itself. It's just tilting this over. And if the image that I'm going to get is this image of rib two. So this is the rib two, which is directly under the axillary artery that I will achieve by tilting the probe over. This is the pec major muscle and the pec minor. I still see those pretty good. And this is actually the image from that woman in the picture. She's pretty lean. Um, and so that I don't see a lot of adipose hair. And I see that this is a 2.7, or sorry, 2.7 centimeter depth here. So I can see all the things that I wanna see. I still see the rib. 
I see the pleura, I see the intercostals, and I see the pec muscles. Those are the things I look for. The third move that I make is to slide this probe caudally and laterally around the breast. And you can even see it where I was here with the probe before because I have too much gel right here. I slide the probe caudally and laterally until I get to the rib four. Okay, and I'm gonna try to visualize, my goal is try to visualize rib three and rib four or rib three and rib four um, with this probe. You see how my probe is actually peeking into the chest. This is a better view of my probe here. The patient's head is turned away again but my probe is sort of on this lateral edge of the breast looking into the chest. And on that third move, I want to get a picture that looks like this. So the final position image is this third picture. And I didn't put color on this. I didn't color these pectoralis muscles because I wanted you to see what the image looked like. Um, this is the ideal picture where you want to place your pectoralis nerve blocks because I can see four things. And I like to do things by systems. So I like to remember these four things. I see this artery here. I see the lungs. I can see the pleura here. And I can see the both of the ribs that I wanna see. I see rib three and rib four. And I can see my needle. This is a pionk needle. And I can see it approaching the rib four, okay? I can see serratus over here. And I want to you to remember that in this final image, I want you to put color on this fascial plane right here, right? We can we know that there are arteries running through here. This is the thoracocromial artery right here. And you can usually visualize this artery. I put color on all of my final images before I place this block, before I drive this needle straight as a backboard to this rib. I put color Doppler here. If I can't see that artery right away, that thoracocromial artery, I sort of do a tilting motion of my probe in ever so slight of a way to see if I can visualize that artery. Sometimes I can't, but usually I can, and I want to make sure that I don't tag it. Because remember that the two things you don't want to have happen in the pectoralis nerve blocks that would crush you and would be very terrible for the patient are hematoma and pneumothorax. So I don't want to tag this artery and cause a hematoma. The surgeon will be upset, I may never be able to block anybody again. And I don't want to cause a pneumothorax, that would be terrible for everybody. Okay, so I can see the lung and I can see the artery, I want to avoid those two. So I go ahead and drive my needle through, I approach the rib and I'm gonna place the PEX2 muscle first. This is the fascial plane here where the PEX2 block is placed. Okay, this is the PEX2 location between the serratus and the, and the um, pectoralis minor muscle. And then, this, and then I draw back the needle and I place the PEX1 block here between the PEC major and the PEC minor. So those are just the pointing to the fascial planes that I'm gonna place the local in eventually. This is a one shot block, okay? Even though there's two blocks in this one block, PEX2, this is a one shot, okay? I'm not gonna reapproach the same rib over and over, right? The more times you move the needle towards something dangerous like the lungs or that artery, the more risk you have of puncturing the artery or the lungs are not seeing your needle again. So that's the third and final position of pecs, the pectoralis nerve blocks wanna do. Um, and here I am with the ultrasound probe and I'm going true in plane approach on this right side first. I do the right side first because I just do things the same way every time and right, I'm right-handed. So I'm using my right hand to block um, and I use the, my left hand to hold the probe. Let me just make sure I have, I've talked about everything here. Okay, so what do I, I get this question a lot. What do I place in this unilateral block? And remember that doing a PEX block one and two on one side is just a unilateral block. It's not gonna be bilateral. So in order to have anesthesia or pectoralis block of the full chest, you have to do both sides. So on one side, a unilateral block of PEX 1 and 2, I would use 30 cc's of local anesthetic. I would put 20 cc's at PEX 2 location, and I would put 10 cc's at PEX 1 location. And I wrote it like that because remember I said that I place PEX 2 first, and then I withdraw the needle, and I place PEX 1. And what would this look like? Well, remember that we all have to be 
cognizant of um, local anesthetic systemic toxicity, right? So we have to know our patient's weight. We have to know how much, calculate how much local they're able to have without reaching that toxic dose. And so here are a few combinations. Of course, you're gonna have to do the math on the patients that you have. But I often use this mixture of liposomal bupivacaine with bupivacaine HDL combination at quarter percent. Sometimes I use bupi of these concentrations depending on the patient. And then sometimes I use ropey. This can all vary depending on what you have available at your hospital or what um, really you have in your block cart or the patient or the surgeon. And so just discuss it with your surgeons. Talk to them about what your plan is. And I know there's a lot of resistance sometimes in the surgical world, world to either, you know, be letting us do this block or maybe not understanding what we're doing and, and the surgeon wanting to inject either, you know, the local themselves or really maybe not trusting the block. I recommend that you get your confidence up by first starting with placing blocks asleep in patients, okay? Because I find that when people first start with patients that are awake, it's sort of unnerving to have a patient that is very anxious and you are trying to block them and it's sort of not ideal conditions. So if you get a chance to start up your block service or your ERAS protocols and you're training people to place these blocks, I can recommend starting asleep in the operating room if you can possibly do that because you get just more time to look at the, the structures and the, um, you don't have to worry about the patient that is anxious. Okay. Um, so this is me depositing local anesthetic at the PEX2 location. Here's the needle. It's not that great of a picture, but I did like it. The local is pouring over the edge. This is rib four. I'm over rib four here. You do see this bubble of local anesthetic here in this PEX2 location, as well as local pouring over here. So I know I have a good spread of the local. Here's that artery. And this is the final depo depositing local at the final location. So this is PEX1 location. I'm splitting that plane there. Here's the needle and here's the PEX2 location with the rib underneath. So I hope those images help you kind of understand how we're getting to those planes, the best way to get to those planes, what kind of patients you're, you're going to do this awake or asleep, your volumes that you're going to use. And then if you don't remember anything, remember that you want to Doppler that fascial plane to find that artery in there that you don't want to tag and then really have a depth of the ultrasound where you can see those lungs. Some people, I find that when I help people do blocks, they sort of cut off their image like this. This is what not to do, okay? You have your rib here and you can't really see the lungs. So if you, do, you were to lose your image of your needle, you may not see it go into the lung. So I like to make the depth enough so that I can see the pleura and I can see the intercostal muscles and I can see just a little bit beyond that, like maybe one centimeter. So I, that's the image that I like to do, to use. Okay, let's talk about tap and QL now. I hope I haven't gone over time. I don't think I have yet. I think I'm still good. <laughs> so tap and QL, what does that look like and why should we be doing this? And um, what are they? Fat, tap and QL blocks are again, fascial plane blocks used for the anesthesia of the anterior abdomen. So these are also blocks that are using higher volume um, higher volume of local anesthesia for unilateral coverage, all right? You can do these blocks just like the PEX blocks. You can do them awake or sleep. So there are really three locations to do these blocks in. You can do them in the pre-op area, the operating room, um, and you can do them in PACU. So some people ask me, like, where should I do these blocks? How should I talk to patients about these blocks? These blocks, so if you get the go-ahead and your surgeon's on board with this, um, I like to do these blocks intraop. That's my favorite place to do these. If you do these blocks preoperatively, you will probably need to sedate the patient. Not, you know, the patients can tolerate these QL blocks either laterally. This person is doing a QL3 block or a transmuscular QL block, and I'll go over the nomenclature here in a couple slides. And then this person is doing a tap block here laterally, and this patient's awake but you probably will need some sedation um, when you go through the skin here. Some, sometimes patients flinch. So I always like using sedation in the pre-op area. The advantages to you doing the blocks in the pre-op area are that you avoid the perception or the perception of delay in the operating room. 
So sometimes, as you guys probably experience too, and tell me in the chat if you this happens to you, that when you decide to do a block in the operating room, you something goes wrong or there's a delay, and then you're getting your ultrasound set up, and then the surgeon is sort of frustrated or tapping their foot because there's a perception of like you delaying the case. And I just, um, I think that that's unnerving and sometimes I don't like to deal with that. So I do it in the pre-op area if I can. I like doing them in the pre-op area. I can talk to the nurses, I can do the timeout, I can do it slow, methodic, like I like. When you do it asleep in the OR, you're still gonna do a timeout um, and you have an asleep patient. So you don't have a patient moving and you don't have to sedate the patient, they're already under anesthesia, right? If you wait until the PACU to block a patient, and sometimes this happens when you have um, a surgery that starts laparoscopic and maybe goes open unexpectedly, or maybe you know that it's gonna go open, and you're left with a patient with a big incision and then pain in the PACU. I recommend that if that was, so I talk to all my patients about um, regional anesthesia if they're posted for laparoscopic techniques. And the way, I, and be, the reason I do that is because I was finding that the surgeries that were converting from laparoscopic to open that needed fascial plane blocks, I had to go and stop everything and go consent the next of kin. And so I didn't want to waste time. I wanted the patient to know that if they opened and had a bigger incision than they anticipated that I would take care of them or the surgeon would take care of them. So I say something like, uh, Mr. Jones, um, if, you know, on this consent, it says that they're going to stay laparoscopic or go laparoscopic, but if they happen to need to make a bigger incision, I'll go ahead and put local numbing medicine in that field or the surgeon will, is that okay? And the, of course, a lot of them, most of them say, yes, that's okay. So that is my consent for laparoscopic patients that I have the option to do that block while the patient's still asleep, right? It gives me the advantage of just blocking the patient right before I wake them up. So if the surgeon makes a bigger incision than expected in the operating room, my technique is to just not extubate the patient, I'll just zoom in real quick, get the ultrasound, place the blocks before those big bandages go over and before you have an abdominal binder that you can't, that you're annoyed with in recovery. <laughs> so pre-emergence fascial plane blocks, if you have an unexpected midline incision or a bigger incision than you expected, are totally appropriate. And I, I love doing those because it saves you the hassle of going to the PACU and doing it there. Because what happens in the PACU when you get to the PACU with a patient that's in pain with a huge incision that doesn't have neuraxial or blocks on board. You have a very uncomfortable patient that's cr either crying, they could be screaming in pain, I've seen that, and they're moving around a lot, right? They're breathing, their diaphragm's moving, their belly's moving. So it's pretty hard target, as well as just the logistics of it are not ideal. So if you ask me what my favorite place to place Q all blocks is probably, the pre-op area because I can have time and I can do it methodically. But remember those three places and remember that you want to get that block in before the patient hits the PACU if you can prevent that from happening. Let me see, okay. This is the mystery of the um, position of the QL. <laughs> this is a, um, a question that I get asked a lot. Where are those QL planes and what is going on with the QL blocks? I am going to talk about how I place this QL1 in C-sections, post-op C-sections, because of the ease and positioning ease at which I place it. Now that picture showed somebody placing a QL3 block, also known as an anterior QL block, or an intramuscular QL. Why? Because these blocks are named in relation to this quadratus lumborum muscle. Um, you see the spine here, this is posterior, and you see the QL muscle with the spinal nerve root coming out actually in front of or anterior to the QL muscle. So that's why this QL3 location, and you can see this needle is the QL3 location, is called anterior QL or intramuscular. Sorry, it's called transmuscular QL. There's also an intramuscular QL that's described sometimes and that's not the QL3. So this block is often done, but it's done in either the lateral position or the patient sitting up. And I'll explain to you why I prefer to do the QL1 location in C-sections. Um, so, the, and, and remember that we're placing our tap blocks. We are, we're also talking about tap blocks tonight. This is the transversus abdominis. So we're placing, you know, a lot of us are still placing the tap block here on top of that transversus abdominis muscle. This is the tap location. And see, it's getting these nerves here. 
but you see these nerves run back behind the aponeurosis of the TA and into sort of the QL muscle in front of it, okay? The QL2 location is the posterior QL. That's placing local anesthesia here, and some people thought that maybe that was safer and still effective because sometimes there's, I mean, there is a risk when you place this QL muscle. Sometimes people think that the imaging is, is difficult, which I agree that if you're not an expert um, regional anesthesiologist or you, your images quite, aren't quite right, you're not going to be as confident to place this deep QL3 block because the kidney lives right here, right? So that is the nomenclature. This, so what about TAP versus QL for C-section? This is a question I get all the time. Dr. Warlick, are you going to place a TAP over there because they're calling for uh, a block for the C-section? Are you going to do a QL? I'm always gonna do a QL right now in this point in time because of this. And this is a lot of words, but afterwards, if you go back and see this talk, I put, I put these words here so you could remember what I said on this block, on this um, slide. So a tap block is limited to the somatic anesthesia of the abdominal wall, right? The front part of the abdominal wall is this, the incisional pain. That's the somatic pain that the patients are gonna feel. This is highly dependent on the fascial spread um, amongst these planes. So, and so, so if you were to place a tap subcostal um, block here, so two tap subcostal blocks will give you an analgesia, analgesic pattern like this on the anterior abdominal wall. This is a fan and steel incision. So that's the incision that we're going to have after C-section. So we can see that the tap subcostal blocks, two of them on um, bilateral, will not cover a fan and steel incision but they might cover like a midline incision on the top. If you had incisions here on the top, they would cover that, like a subcostal incision would be covered as well. And you also see, and that's T6 to T10 here. If you do a tap, a lateral tap block bilaterally, which is gonna cover T10 and T, to, to T12, you are gonna cover that fan and steel incision, uh, that incisional pain for those women that have, have had a C-section. So you can choose to do two tap blocks. Um, in the recovery room after the baby's out, okay? And remember that we're usually doing these blocks on post-C-section patients after the baby's out, right? Because we are using local and we really don't wanna be injecting local, especially liposomal bupivacaine before the baby's out, but we do wanna use this approach in the recovery room. So um, I want you to remember this. Okay, this is, this is interesting. My brother-in-law is an obstetrician and I was having a conversation with him about what causes pain, what he sees as the problem with pain after C-section. And he said things that I totally forgot about or I didn't have the same perspective, a surgeon's perspective about post-operative C-section pain. We know that C-section pain is not only just incisional, right? It's not just this fan and steel incision that's causing the pain, but it's the visceral pain that is part of a huge problem that women have after C-section. So the uterus, and this is what my brother-in-law told me. He's like, you know, we, we exteriorize the uterus and you all see that when they take the uterus out and they put the laps inside the uterus and you have a full spinal on, but you still see the mom cringe. I know right in the comments, if you've seen this, I've seen it all the time where the woman, women is just cringing when they're exteriorizing the uterus. That is visceral pain. That's like the definition of what visceral pain looks like. Just a crampy pain. When the exterior is that uterus, they also, my brother-in-law reminded me that sometimes they put those B-Lynch sutures around the uterus when they have uterine acne. That is a source of um, visceral pain as well. And then I forgot about this. There, the oxytocin infusion will keep running often, you know, four to eight hours after the C-section is done. That is also a source of crampiness, right? Because oxytocin is squeezing that uterus, trying to clamp it down. And so sometimes they're running those oxytocin infusions high. My brother-in-law said that you know, now it is sort of standard, I don't know the ACOG standards, but now it is pretty standard to run like a four hour, eight hour oxytocin infusion. So we have to remember, and I, I tell you all this because I want you to remember that you're not, when you hear comments like, you know, that pain's not bad, I'll put some numbing medicine there at the incision. That's not all we're talking about, right? We're not just talking about that fan and still incision. And I want you to remember that when you're talking to surgeons about the reasons that you should or maybe sh should be offering um, these blocks to C-section patients. So why do I love the QL1 and why do I always choose to do that? 
Well, the QL can cover not only somatic, but this visceral pain that we talked about, the reasons you have visceral pain. It can cover both of those, right? And so I like the QL, not only because it's kind of easy. It's, I don't, I'm not doing four blocks. I'm just doing two blocks. So I'm placing QL1 blocks bilaterally, and I'm getting an anesthetic pattern on the anterior abdominal wall that looks like this. So I'm covering the fan and steel. I'm covering this region, but I'm also covering some of that somatic pain to treat the, that, sorry, the visceral pain, to treat those things that the women are feeling. Because when you go to round on them the next day, some of them don't point to the incision when they say, my pain is here, right? Even today, I went to do post-op rounds in OB, and I said, where's your pain? And she pointed to her belly, like right around T10, and she was like, it's crampy. Right? That is the pain that we want to be covering, and I believe, and I will prove to you or convince, try to convince you that the QL1 is what we want to be doing. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of studies. This study by Blanco in 2018 looked at the QL block versus the TAP block for postoperative pain in C-section, and that study concluded that the QL block was more effective in reducing morphine consumption, and that effect was observed up to 48 hours postoperatively. So there you have it. That is the study sort of changed my mind. And, you know, also my anecdotal experience, the experience I was having blocking these women also told me that, hey, that this pain just isn't about that incision, right? This, another study by Hansen from 2019 in, in Rapham um, talked about bilateral transmuscular QL. So remember I told you that the QL3 block, which is the block closest to the kidney, um, transmuscular QL significantly reduced the 24-hour opioid consumption in C-section. So what does this tell us? This tells me that if you have an opportunity and the skills to use the QL3, you should. The reason that I choose to do the QL1, and I think that's next, I'll tell you that I use the QL1 for postoperative C-section purely because of logistics, okay? In the private practice, the busy private practice that I'm in, oftentimes you're not only you're not only dealing with OB, but you're dealing with you have other operating rooms to deal with, and sometimes those OB wards are not a remote, right? They're far, sometimes far away from your operating room. So, for time's sake and for positioning sake and for um, the sake of staff involved, I think it is prudent to not turn the patients after C-section or sit them up. There's a lot of chaos going on in the recovery rooms in obstetrics. So I'll show you what I do and how I do it. So I'm not going to talk about the QL3. Um, I'm going to talk about what I do after people get out of C-section. So this is the QL1 block. And this paper was just the ultras showing the ultrasound guided QL block. You can see here that there, they have a tap, like a tap view image here, the external oblique, internal oblique, and the TA. And you can see the aponeurosis of the TA coming out here. We would normally place a, t the, a tap block right here. You can see along this fascial plane and you can see that they're pointing to this QL muscle here. And they're depositing this local lateral to the QL. Remember that I told you that the QL1 is also called the lateral QL because it's just placing local anesthesia just lateral to this quadratus lumborum muscle. So that's what this, was, this picture is about. How do I do that? After the patient comes out after C-section, I take them or they're, they're wheeled to the recovery room and I have an ultrasound like this or like a smaller one. And I come in here on this right side, they're supine. And the great part about it, remember, is that they'll probably still have a spinal in place. So use the spinal to your advantage. Hopefully your surgeons are fast enough to not have the spinal wear off before you get to vacuum. That is true some, sometimes. But usually the patients will have a spinal on board so you don't have to worry about numbing up the site and they can't even feel you. They just know you're gonna do the block because you already consented them and the nurses know you're coming. So there's a bunch of chaos here. Usually there's a baby and then there's like pediatricians all over and you like just, like a ninja, you come in and you start your blocks while the spinal is still in place and it's amazing. So that's how I do it. And after I place the right side, I just hop on over here and I push this ultrasound back against the wall. I don't move it around. It's too much time, too much effort. Um, I want to do things fast and safe. So I just push this against the wall and I come in here on the left side and I block um, the QL1 location here. 
So I'd like you to take a few of the notes about the considerations or um, I have them here. So this is a patient I did recently. We brought her out to recovery room and I, um, this is the setup I used for her in the recovery room in OB. She um, placed, like I said, place the block before the spinal is resolved. That'll help you a lot. No one will even know you're there. The patient is not bothered at all by it. Um, remember that the imaging sometimes in this picture in post C-section, it can be a little bit um, full, of, full of air. So, you know, as they dissect the uterus out and, and take things in and out of the abdominal cavity, you can entrap air. So sometimes in the lateral pictures, you will have some hyperechoic imaging. Um, not very often, but just know that that could happen. Um, I keep the patient supine and I place the QL1. I, I have placed QL3s before, um, but I, if, if it's my regular day routine stuff, I'm gonna place that QL1 because it's fast and it's effective and I can place it before anyone even really knows I'm there. What do I use? I, once again, just like the PEX blocks, I use 30 cc's of local on each side for high volumes. Remember, we wanna, we wanna use higher volumes in order to get that spread on the fascial planes, like a highway on these fascial planes. I, you can either use my drugs of choice, liposomal bupivacaine with a bupivacaine mix, because I have a fast onset, right? Especially in recover, I want this fast onset followed by this long, this length on the block, or you can just use your ropivacate in different concentrations or your bupivacaine even by itself. So that's the volume that I advise you to start placing. Um, here's some more considerations. If you have a patient that has had a general anesthetic, either um, unexpectedly, so we all know that sometimes the baby's not doing well and we rush to the operating room, we don't have time for the spinal. So we, we're off to sleep with general anesthesia, but we don't have, we didn't, we didn't put any neuraxial opioids in and we don't have any local at the incision. And so the patient literally wakes up screaming in pain. And I know you've seen this before. Um, we block those patients, right? We block those patients and we take all the stuff to recovery room and they're often squirmy and they're crying usually. So what I do is I ask the nurses not to start pushing fentanyl or, you know, morphine or Dilaudid right away. I ask them to take just a few minutes to let me place the block. And I find that if I have like a fast, uh, like a faster acting local with that long local on the back end, I can usually have the patients comfortable within like 15 to 20 minutes. So I'll place, place the blocks. Um, I'll say, hold on, don't give, don't give opioids, just wait till this block kicks in. And I've seen remarkable, remarkable results with this technique, especially with those patients that didn't get a chance to have a spinal. Um, the difference is, it's, it's, a, it's a noticeable, remarkable difference. The, and remember just the, from my brother-in-law's advice, he, the patient may remain on oxytocin for 48 hour, four to eight hours after C-section. So it's another source of visceral pain that we, that we can treat. Um, and- Three minute warning, please, Dr. Warlick. Three what's minute. that? Three minute warning, please. Okay. I only have two more images, I think. This is an image that I um, found on a post-C-section patient of a TA. You could see the needle approaching the, the aponeurosis here. And this is my final image here. This was that lady. And you can see that a lot of people ask me, like, I'm not going to be able to see that TA location. It's going to be too big and too hard. You can see that this transverse abdominis muscle, you can visualize this easy. The bowel's here and this plane is the plane you want to reach. And that is the image that I obtained with probe right here. Really posterior, almost up against this bed. And um, I place the needle up above and come in to this plane and sort of place that local all lateral to that QL muscle. So I think that that's it, you guys. I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much for spending your time here, even on the replay. Thanks for coming back and listening to it. Everybody, you're doing amazing work. We've all had a hard time during this pandemic, and I know that you're doing the extra, going the extra mile to provide acute pain services to your patients. I know it's not easy. I know that it's complicated sometimes. Keep having those conversations with surgeons. Keep trying to educate them about why it's so important to treat acute pain for women in C-section and mastectomy educate yourself so you have more knowledge and more ammunition to provide the services that you know are amazing. And that 
Hey, so if you want to tweet us later, here's where we are. Here are Mark and I, our social media on Twitter, and then my email there if you guys want to get a hold of me. And that's all, I think. Dr. Warlick, thank you very much. There was a lot of information there to get in. You deserve that drink. So you did very, very, very well. <laughs> Um, so we've had some great questions coming in um, from our attendees today, so we've worked through some of these. Um, so the first question that came in was regarding pneumothorax with PEX blocks, um, and what's, what do you feel is the incidence of a pneumothorax with, with pectoralis blocks? I saw that question. I, don't, I can't give you an exact number. I haven't looked at the literature just recently. I can tell you that um, from I have never I have never had a pneumothorax with one of these blocks, and I. I haven't had a partner have one. Um, I don't know the incidents. Maybe somebody can tell me in the chat, but I do know that when I showed you that final image of the ribs and the needle and the artery, I don't ever move my needle severely or in a trajectory where I can't see that needle. And I find that with the needles I'm using to avoid the pneumothorax or the hematoma, remember those two things that you don't want to have happen in PEX blocks. I find that if I go slow, and I see my needle, I see the shaft, the tip, the whole needle, that I am meticulous about seeing the lung and I can use that rib as a backboard that it, you know, I haven't had a problem with it. And I know that's not the answer to the question, but that's how I try to avoid it. <laughs> and that was actually another, several people asked that question that in their residency, for example, they were always taught to touch the rib and then come back off the rib. Um, Obviously, with ultrasound, with a good needle, with good hand-eye uh, technique or good hand-needle technique, um, you should be able to see your needle at all times. But yeah, if in doubt, make sure you're aiming towards the rib and not between those spaces of the rib, I always advise. Yes. Um, in, so another good question, and you know, PEX, PEX1 and PEX2, and we went over the nomenclature of those blocks, and there's all a, a lot of confusion with people saying, I performed a PEX1 and a PEX2, you know, so and we already said you would always, if you did a PEX2, be performing a PEX1 alongside that. But is there an indication where you would only perform a PEX1 block? There may be. So remember that... Um, the PEX1 block is anesthetizing the pectoralis muscles, right? So if I had a procedure that was just moving those muscles around, so say it was like a port or you were replacing an AICD where I didn't need that PEX2 block, right? I didn't need anesthesia of the axilla or a serratus block type block. I just needed anesthesia of those two pectoralis muscles, then a PEX1 would be appropriate. But it's a rare occasion. So I kind of think of the two together. I think if I'm going to do a PEX one block, I'm going to go ahead and do the PEX two block usually. Um, but yeah, there, there are indications where you would just be placing that PEX one block. And by the way, the PEX unilateral block is a uh, functions amazingly well in um, AICD and your pacemaker implants for the whole anesthetic. The whole anesthetic can be done just like that. Excellent. And you know, another question again is, uh, we're fortunate for breast surgery that we have quite a lot of blocks at our disposal and we had several questions come in. Why not an ESP block? Why not a serratus anterior plane block? Why a PEX block? Why would you choose a PEX block if it was a member of your family having breast surgery? What would you like to, to choose for them? Well, if it was a member, I always think, so we, as regionalists, we sort of always think like, what should we do for this patient? But what would you know, I do for my mom or my friend's mom. And, you know, when I think about this, I think of my um, med school roommate having recurrent cancer and what she would want, right? So I think that I would place a PEX box for mastectomy. There is enough literature, I think there's three or four studies that compare or discuss placing either PEX or ESP, and I'm not going to talk about paravertebrals, but in, in the literature, we hear a lot about ESP and it's sort of this very cool new block. And a lot of people ask me, hey, are you gonna place the PEX or the ESP for this mastectomy? I, I've done both. Um, I did a series where I did all PEX a couple years ago, and then I tried to do ESPs. And even in my own experience, I found that the pectoralis blocks work better. And the literature also supports that, Mark. And they, they discuss that when you're, you know, when you're placing the PEX one and two, you are blocking those muscles, right? You're blocking the medial and the lateral pectoral nerves that innervate those actual muscles. 
And when you're using the PEX2 muscle, you're also blocking, you know, you can go down to the serratus muscle, you're blocking, you know, the long thoracic nerve, th thoracic, thoracodorsal nerves, the long thoracic nerves. Those nerves are indicated in pain, acute and chronic pain, when you have post-mastectomy pain syndrome. So those nerves, if you, they, they, it's speculated that if you block those nerves that carry nociceptive and proprioceptive fibers, you can avoid that sort of wind up of the central nervous system that causes chronic pain. I think the block is very specific to those fibers. And so blocking the sensations to those muscles better blocks that pain eventually. That ESP, you just don't see an ESP. And there are a few studies. I think there's one study in 2019 using 40 patients that showed, you know, they divided up the patients into ESP or PEX blocks. And they did show that PEX reduced pain, the pain scores more effectively than those ESP blocks. So for me or my family member, for modified radical mastectomy with dissection or without dissection, I would choose a PEX block bilateral. <laughs> okay, thank you. That sums that one up. Um, so a couple of questions regarding, would you perform a QL block for cesarean section patients if you use duramorphs within your epidural, is there any benefit of still performing that QR block if the patients had duramorph within their epidural? Yes, I we are. I personally use um, intrathecal morphine or and in an epidural morphine when I can. So if a patient has an epidural, I bolus that epidural with morphine before I pull it. But but I don't want people to think of these as I, I want you to be using your. Um, neuraxial opioids in addition to these fascial plane blocks in C-section. We do have studies that show that this intrathecal morphine still has benefits. It also has side effects, but still has benefits to a comprehensive sort of ERAS package in C-section. So I, I advise, and this is what I do personally, keep the intra, intrathecal morphine, keep the epidural morphine, but offer these QL blocks to those patients that I described at the beginning, the ones with chronic pain, anxiety, previous pain with C-section, those kind of patients. Thank you, Dr. Warwick. So I think we're coming to the end of our time now. Um, I just want to point out that the poster that we've left up on the screen there, um, these are a new set of posters that are available from Pionk. Um, the email address to request those posters is also on that screen. Um, and you'll find information on those new posters on the Pionk website at pionk.com. Um, the posters come in a set and if you're interested in the posters and any of the topics that we've talked in this and the previous webinar, um, all of the blocks uh, and some of the instruction related to those blocks, refreshers, aid memoirs and just to jog your memory about those blocks are all contained in these posters. So I want to say a huge thank you to Dr. Warlick um, for your time today and for your excellent presentation. There's a lot of information in there. Um, I've put the link to the Pyunk YouTube channel, so if you uh, couldn't keep up with our presentation, joined late, want to watch again or want to share this presentation with your colleagues, then please go to the Pyunk YouTube channel to get access to that. And on behalf of Azra and Pyunk, I want to thank everybody for participating in today's event. Have a great rest of your day, your evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you.